Okay, this is chapter four of The Pharaohs of Ancient Egypt by Elizabeth Payne. This is, um, I show thee a land topsy-turvy. This is from about 2553 BC to about 1505 BC. Is a time period that's being covered in this book. One night toward the end of the last century, five native thieves were digging in the scrubland near the edge of the Egyptian desert. There was no moon, and the men worked as swiftly and silently as shadows. They had been thrusting their spades into the sand for more than two hours when one of the man, men tensed. His shovel had struck something hard. With a sharp s, he summoned his companions, and all five men dropped to their knees and began scooping away the sand with their hands. Moments later, the thieves squatted back on their heels to stare down at the object they had uncovered. Then one man laughed, another snorted in disgust, and the other three began to curse. For what they had dug up was the, a large mummified crocodile. Now, a mummified crocodile was the last thing in the world the thieves had hoped to find. They were digging for antiquities, a necklace once worn by a pharaoh's queen, an offering bowl from a long vanished temple, or the statuette of an ancient Egyptian god. For since the coming of the archaeologists, everyone in Egypt had learned that all sorts of priceless objects lay buried beneath their desert sands. Most natives were too apathetic to care, but there were a, few, a greedy few who began digging recklessly for profit. Egyptian antiquities had become a fad with collectors the world over, and the natives knew that Cairo dealers would pay them handsomely for a lucky find. The Egyptian government tried to stop these native diggers by law. Of course, it wanted to end their destructive plunder, but more important, it felt that relics from the days of the pharaohs should go to the Cairo Museum, not to private collectors abroad. But laws did not stop the natives. They simply went underground and excavated secretly at night. For there were black market dealers in Cairo's back alleys who would still pay them handsomely for a lucky find. Now a mummified crocodile was certainly a find, though scarcely a lucky one, for it was much too big to be hidden under a cloak and smuggled into Cairo. So the five thieves dragged the crocodile off to a cave at the, at the desert's edge and burned its leathery old body to a crisp. Then, since the night was still young, they went on digging. To their disgust, they uncovered another mummified crocodile, then a third, and a fourth. The thieves dragged these off to the cave and burned them as they had the first. Then they had a parley, held a parley. They had obviously stumbled upon a crocodile cemetery. In ancient days, crocodiles had been worshiped in certain parts of the Nile Valley. On death, these sacred animals were buried in special cemeteries around a small temple dedicated to Sobk, the crocodile god. Sobk's cha chapels contained votive offerings of all kinds amulets, statues, and sacred vessels of gold, silver, and alabaster. Prizes such as these, the five thieves knew, would bring a fortune on the black market. So they voted to go on digging in hope of finding the cemetery chapel, which they knew must, be lie, must lie buried beneath the sand somewhere nearby. The thieves dug up and burned more than 100 big mummified crocodiles during the next year. Then at last their patience was rewarded. One night, they uncovered the top of the small chapel they had been searching for. Tense with excitement, they cleared away the sand, chopped a hole in the chapel roof, and lowered themselves down into the darkness below. With shaking fingers, the thieves lighted their candles and peered about. On top of a stone altar in the center of the room lay the mummified body of a baby crocodile. Otherwise, nothing. The little chapel was as bare as a bone. In a fury of rage and disappointment, one of the thieves seized the mummified baby crocodile, swung it up over his head, and smashed it down on the stone altar, its brittle body broken in half. And out onto the floor tumbled more than half a dozen ancient papyrus scrolls. The baby crocodile had been stuffed with 2,000-year-old waste paper. Fortunately... Although it is not known how, archaeologists got a hold of this waste paper before the thieves could sell it or throw it away as junk. The scrolls turned out to be the day-by-day -day records kept by the overseer of an Egyptian country estate. 
They were full of invaluable information about commercial and agricultural life in the days of ancient Egypt's decline. But imagine the despair of the archaeologists when they learned that 100 or more big crocodiles had been burned to ashes in the desert cave, for it was reasonable to suppose that they too had been stuffed with discarded papyrus scrolls. And who could say how many ancient letters, poems, accounts the temple records had gone up in smoke? Lost to archaeology forever. Papyrus scrolls have turned up in all sorts of unlikely places in Egypt, though in none so unusual as the stomach of a mummified baby crocodile. Archaeologists have found them clutched in the bony fingers of ancient mummies. They've found them inside half-broken jars, in temple caskets, and underneath and underneath sand mounds that turned out to be the rubbish heaps of ancient cities. Through these brittle scrolls, the ancient Egyptians have told archaeologists a great deal about themselves. Two such scrolls, for example, give a vivid picture of the troubled times that afflicted the valley not long after Pharaoh Cheops' death. This land is helter-skelter, read the faded ink on the first scroll. I show thee a land topsy-turvy. I show thee the son as foe, the brother as an enemy, and a man killing his father. The second scroll went on. The highborn are full of lamentation, but the poor are jubilant. Every town saith, let us drive out the powerful. The splendid judgment hall has been stripped of its documents. The public offices lie open, and their records have been stolen. Serfs have become the masters of serfs. Behold, they that had clothes are now in rags. Squalor is throughout the, the land. No clothes are white these days. Denial is in flood, yet no one has the heart to plow. The dead are thrown in the river. Laughter has perished. Grief, grief walks the land. Now this sounds very much as though the Egyptian poor had revolted against Pharaoh and seized control of the valley themselves. But archaeologists do not think this is what actually happened. There was certainly a period of disorder and anarchy in Egypt not long after Cheops' death, but it was caused by a revolution among the nobles, not by an uprising of the people. Perhaps more than any other pharaoh in Egypt's long history, Cheops seems best to have personified his people's ideal of a great god-king. So far as can be told, the Egyptians worshipped and served him with pride and devotion. This is a fragment of an ancient papyrus scroll. The script is hier hieratic, a kind of longhand version of hieroglyphs really pretty. But the pharaohs who followed Cheops on the throne seem to have lacked his character, strength, and dignity. And as one weak pharaoh succeeded another, the nobles and priests around them grew stronger and bolder. Little by little, these men began to nibble away at their god king's absolute power. The priests of the great sun god Ra were the first to limit pharaoh's might. Long considered the wise men of Egypt, these priests had grown in number and influence since unification. When Cheops' dynasty, the fourth, came to an end about 50 years after his death, the priests of Ra were strong enough to put kings of their own choosing on the throne. Pharaoh, they claimed, was henceforth to be considered the son of Ra, and no longer an independent god in his own right. As the earthly representatives of Pharaoh's great father, the sun, the priests of Ra now became powers behind the throne. They began to play an increasingly influential role in the affairs of Egypt, sometimes openly, sometimes behind the scenes. Pharaoh's once devoted nobles were the next to defy his absolute authority. Cheops and the earlier pharaohs had owned all the land in Egypt themselves. They had allotted great estates to their favorites with the understanding that such estates would revert to the crown on the noble's death. But now these men began to claim that Pharaoh's land grants were theirs by right, assuming the title Erapti Hatia, or Hereditary Prince. They used the land as they saw fit and willed it on death to their children. With no army to back them up, the Pharaohs who followed Cheops on the throne were powerless to retake their property. And so great feudal estates began to grow up along the banks of the Nile. Each was ruler over ruled over by a local prince who grew increasingly hostile to his neighbors and increasingly independent of his king. 
these powerful princes at last even dared to challenge Pharaoh's control over their life in the next world, just as they were challenging his control over their lives on earth. The nobles now claimed their right to a life after death, whether Pharaoh needed them to serve him in the next world or not. Life after death, the nobles said, had been promised to every worthy man by Osiris, the god of the dead. Since unification, the cult of the god Osiris had been growing in strength and popularity among the valley people. According to an ancient myth, Osiris had been a god king of Egypt back at the beginning of time. He had been murdered by his jealous brother, and when brought back to life by the powerful magic of his wife Isis, the resurrected Osiris then became king of the next world, the first of the Westerners. For the next world was thought to lie somewhere beyond the setting sun, and those who died were said to have gone west. Osiris ruled from his underworld judgment hall. There, the Egyptians had come to believe an awesome trial awaited every man after his death. After a perilous trip through the dark and demon-filled underworld, the dead man reached the portals of the judgment hall and was brought before Osiris. He was then solemnly judged guilty, or not guilty, of 42 mortal sins. If he could answer not guilty to all, Osiris would gravely motion him to continue on to the next world. But if the dead man was found guilty of any one of the sins, a great beast would pad forward from the shadows, fangs bared, and a beast part crocodile, part lion, and part hippopotamus. The guilty man would be devoured on the spot, and that would be the end of his hopes for a life everlasting. Uh, this is a picture of the underworld judgment hall of Osiris. The God of the dead is seated on the throne on the right. Um, a dead princess stands next to the scales as Anubis, the jackal headed God of embalming weighs her heart against the feather of truth. If the princess has trustworthy, trustfully committed no sins, Osiris will motion her on to the next world. So I guess humanity is, uh, in ancient Egyptian time, was expecting that they had to live a perfect life. And I wonder how many of them actually did that. Hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I would say zero, too. Okay. Thus, the nobles now claimed it was not service to the pharaoh that, de that determined whether or not a man lived on after death. It was a man's own worthiness, as judged by Osiris, that decided his fate. And so the nobles ceased building their tombs, clustered close around pharaohs, as they had done for so many centuries. Instead, they denied the, their god king's power over their destiny by building their tombs far from his, in the valley cliffs beyond behind their own estates. Approximately 400 years after Cheops's death, the defiant nobles had grown so strong that all central authority in Egypt at last collapsed. The country sank into a period of anarchy known as her Dark Ages that lasted nearly 100 years. The valley was torn apart and divided against itself. Little pharaohs, each ruling his own domain along the river, fought their neighbors for land and power. The country's vital irrigation systems fell into disrepair. Periodic famine crippled the land and lawlessness was widespread. The land, as the faded scroll had said, was indeed topsy-turvy. It was during this time, archaeologists believe, that thieves broke into the Great Pyramid of Giza and robbed Cheops' burial chamber of its jewels, furnishings, and statuary. And it was these thieves, too, who probably destroyed Cheops' mummy to avoid the revenge of his ka, for the body of the good god has never been found. A prince from the little upriver village of Thebes at uh, long last restored order to the valley. He marched against the other barons and subdued them one by one. Then he proclaimed himself pharaoh of a once again united Egypt and transferred the capital from Memphis to his native city in Upper Egypt. The barons, however, were not yet ready to give up their pa the power they had held for so long. They plunged the valley into warfare time and time again. Not until another Theban named Ameneh, Amenemhet seized the throne and founded the powerful 12th dynasty, did Egypt once again enjoy lasting peace. The 12th dynasty was to last for 200 years. Pharaoh Amenhem, <laughs> this is hard, I'm sorry. Amenemhet's powerful successors 
ruled as, quote, the good shepherds, end quote, of a contended and once more unified people. Great irrigation projects were undertaken again. Trade, broken off during the feudal period, was resumed with Syria and Palestine. The valley people prospered as they had under Pharaoh Cheops some 500 years before. But then catastrophe struck again. This time, the trouble came from outside Egypt's borders. Quote, a blast of God smote us, end quote, wrote the ancient historian Manetho. And unexpectedly from the regions of the east, invaders of obscure race marched in confidence of victory against our land. By main force, they easily seized it without striking a blow. And having overpowered the rulers of the land, they then burned our cities ruthlessly, raised to the ground the temples of the gods, and treated all the natives with a cruel hostility. Finally, they appointed a king, one of their number. These invaders of obscure race were the Hyksos of Syria. Some archaeologists believe they filtered into the delta until they were strong enough to take over the country. Others think they swept down into Egypt as an invading horde, driving horses hitched to chariots, which the astonished Egyptians had never seen before. Here's the world of the pharaohs, a map right here of the area. This is the Mediterranean Sea, and then we have the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, so we can kind of get our bearings of where things are at over in the eastern part, and then Egypt here, and then Memphis, um, where the capital was before. So, yeah. In either case, with no standing army of her own, Egypt fell to the invaders without struggle. The Hyksos made their capital in Avaris in the Delta, and they declared their own chieftains to be the official successors of the pharaohs. For 150 humiliating years, the Egyptians were ruled by these vile and wretched foreigners. Rescue came again, as it had before, from the upper Egyptian town of Thebes. There, a powerful prince named Camos built a fleet and sailed downriver to the storm to storm the enemy capital. He was killed in the battle that followed, but his brother, Prince Amos, carried on the fight. It was Amos who at last broke the power of the hated conquerors. He captured and burned their delta capital. And then he chased the Hyksos out of Egypt, driving them across the desert and back to the Syria they had left 150 years before. While Amos was pursuing the Hyksos, the nobles made one last try for independent power, but Amos returned and ruthlessly put them down, this time, once, this time for once and all. During the rest of Egypt's long history, the nobles were almost as subservient to Pharaoh as they had been during Cheops' time. They served him devotedly as his officials at home and abroad. Amos proclaimed himself the first Pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. It was to be the most brilliant in Egypt's history. The capital was once more established at Thebes, and Amos announced that Amon, the Theban city god, was henceforth to be worshipped as the king of the gods. For it was Amon, almost believed. One second, we're going to take a look at these. Um, this picture here before we move on. So this is a company of Nubian archers made of painted wood and discovered in the tomb of the ancient Egyptian army officer. Uh, such soldiers may have helped the pharaoh um, Amos drive the Hyksos out of Egypt. Pretty interesting. Okay, so, um, for it was Amo, Amon, almost believed, who had led him to victory against the vile Hyksos. Time and again, the successors of Amos had to march against the rebellious Syrians and Nubians. Amos's youngest son, Tutmos, who became pharaoh in about 1524 BC, spent most of his reign in warlike expeditions against the Syrian uh, princelings. He held the valley men farther afield than they had ever ventured before, all the way to the upper reaches of the great Euphrates River. There, Tutmos erected a, co a commemorative tablet for, quote, never, end quote, has he truthfully said, quote, had the like happened to other Egyptian kings, end quote, before him. When Tutmos I died, he was buried in an underground tomb in a desolate valley behind the western cliffs opposite Thebes. Known as the Valley of the Kings, this eerie spot was to be the royal burying ground for centuries to come. 
the days of pyramid building had passed. Almost 1,000 years had now gone by since Pharaoh Cheops sat upon the golden throne of Egypt. Yet a serf, or a noble from Cheops's time, would have felt quite at home in Tutmos I's Egypt. It is true that the capital had been transferred to Thebes and that Memphis was no longer the center of valley life. The temples were perhaps more imposing and the priests more numerous. Osiris now reigned supreme in the world beyond and a little local god named Ammon of Thebes had become the great state god of Egypt. But otherwise little had changed. The three seasons of flood, planting, and harvesting went on as they had from time immemorial, surrounded by the same anxieties and ceremonies. Life at court and in the villages and on the great country estates had scarcely changed in ten long centuries. The craftsmen and field workers of Tutmos the first day plied their trades and planted their crops with the very same techniques used in Cheops's day. Even fashion had not changed. The men and women of the nobility wore the same sort of wigs, makeup, jewelry, and clothing that had been worn 1,000 years earlier, except that their linen kilts and sheaths were now sometimes finely pleated. And yet, there were differences. The upheavals of the last 1,000 years had taught the valley people two lessons that they would never forget. The time of anarchy under the feudal barons had convinced them of the vital need for a strong central government under a pharaoh whose divine authority must never again be questioned, and the Hyksos invasion had taught them that their isolated valley was not safe from attack after all. Egypt was never again to be without an army, and she came to feel that her only safety lay, lay in subduing the nations around her so that none among them could ever invade the valley again.